My name is Gaurav Arora and I'm a Partner Solutions Architect with AWS in Sydney, Australia. I would like to welcome you to my session, Enterprise Cloud Migration Meets Application Containerization on AWS. Now, before we jump right into the topic, I would like to start with talking about something more fun. Let's talk about the zoo. I know most of us like going to the zoo. I know I do. And for my four-year-old, going to the zoo, checking out all the animals, asking his daddy million questions is a must every couple of months. But with so many animals, big or small, some new as well, how do I best plan my day and keep my son engaged? Now, if you go back to your own memory lane, last time you were in the zoo, once you bought your tickets online or in person, you got inside, first thing they do is to give you a map. And this map charts all the sections, enclosures, animals, and all the amenities you're gonna use that day. Now, some zoos also provide a recommended path on that map, or you can make your own. You can go clockwise, anti-clockwise, or cut through the middle to see the big line, all the decisions you have to make that day. If you think about it, there are some similarities between the zoo story and cloud migration journey. With so many considerations, activities, teams to work with, tools and technologies to play with, multiple ways to complete your cloud migration. Wouldn't it be better if you had a map? And for that, we devised AWS Cloud Migration Framework, which serves as a guided map, provides you all the common approaches and key considerations you may undertake. Now you may ask, why do I need this map? For three reasons. It makes it easy for you by removing all the guesswork. Helps you increase the velocity where you need it. Reduces risk, puts you back on track if you go off-road. AWS Cloud Migration Framework has two mental models. The first one is our five-phase migration process that provides like a macro view of your cloud migration journey. The second mental model is six R's, or application migration patterns, that provide the micro view of your application and they, how they need to be treated while you take them to cloud. Let's look at both of them at a very high level. As the map of the zoo has sections, a typical cloud migration process will have five phases. And it starts with preparation and business planning. In this phase, you'll try to answer, why do you need to migrate or modernize your applications on cloud? What are the business drivers behind it? What is the scope of the overall migration program? How are you planning towards it? What type of investment do you need in terms of time, money, and resources? The second phase is application portfolio discovery. And in this phase, you'll try to answer which exact applications are you going to take to cloud? How will you profile these applications and their dependencies? How will you prioritize your migration backlog? And the scope for your discovery can be your entire application portfolio, applications serving a particular business unit, or a single application. It's all based on your requirements and your use case. The third and fourth phases, let's say, are intertwined. We start with application design. We define the target state that covers AWS architecture, container services, and application architecture. Also some operational components as well. Then we move to migration and validation, where you execute on your migration sprints. You undertake activities such as build, migrate, integrate, and validate leading to a successful go-live. The fifth phase is agile operations, use of automation and pipelines through to continuous delivery. Now let's look at the second mental model, six R's. Just like the zoo map has enclosures, big or small, some huge with extra strong fences, we have application migration patterns to suit multiple applications. The first pattern is retain, 
keep your applications as is, do nothing. The second pattern is retire. Some of the applications be decommissioned in future. The third pattern is rehost. It's like a lift and shift of your application. But in container world, it'd be like converting your in-place VM into a container. And we strongly suggest avoiding that because containers are not virtual machines. As a best practice, containers are immutable, disposable, and most often stateless objects. The fourth pattern is replace. Is there a potential to replace this application with a SaaS equivalent? Now, from a container perspective, we see our customers adopting next two patterns more than the first four. The fifth pattern is replatform. It means changing the state of your application in cloud without major overhaul. For example, taking a monolithic application, converting that into one or multiple containers. You may also undertake RDS or other database flavors to provide consistent database experience. The sixth pattern and the most fun is refactor. We're talking about monolithic to microservices type of transformation. That may require major architecture overhaul, rewrite of the application code, and we do that the cloud native way through to continuous delivery. Now, so far we understood why maps are beneficial from a cloud migration perspective, and for that we have AWS cloud migration journey with five-phase migration process providing the macro view and six hours providing the micro view or application treatment view per application. Now going back to the migration process, let's look at what the map says about container specific considerations per phase, starting with preparation. Now, as you decided, you're going to the zoo and wondering how to get best value out of it. Buying ticket online or in person, going there on a weekend or a weekday, it all starts with someone convincing someone else to spend a bit of money. And for that, we use business case. The whole planning and the experience needs to be business aligned, not because Kubernetes or containers are in trend today. A quick tip based on my personal experience, try to understand your organization or your business units, KPIs and strategy. They'll help you plan better. And if you don't know, no problem. All you need to do is ask around. Now, if you ask your leadership, what do they think about Kubernetes and containers? And most likely they'll tell you, they heard or read that these technologies may bring better agility in the business, increase productivity from an automation perspective, help them reduce cost and future spending. So you need to think about tangible benefits backed by strong metrics and work backwards. Next phase is discovery. Now you can't come up with metrics without understanding the scope of your migration. And for that, you need to go deep into your application portfolio. Recommendation is to use automated discovery tool but make sure you cross-reference the data with other sources such as CMDB or Active Directory or both. Now you may find all sorts of data about your applications, but you need to train your eyes to look for container specific information such as, where are the application binaries stored? What's the location for data configuration and secrets? What are the application to application dependencies upstream and downstream? What are the network and latency requirements? Are there any restrictions from a software licensing perspective as you take applications to cloud? Because they all feed into the next step, qualification. How do you qualify your applications for containerization? Now, based on our experience, here are some criteria that, that are in favor of containers. Does your application has a container flavor? If not, find out from your vendor or try to influence them using a feature request. Does the platform that underpins the application has a container flavor? For example, Tomcat, Drupal, Pega. Is your application stateless? 
means there is no local persistent storage and it uses backing services for everything persistence. Like I mentioned, as a best practice, container need be immutable, disposable, and easy to scale. And having a stateless architecture helps with that. Is your application part of CI CD practices? As it will help test quickly and move to containers. And if you have application that does not align with this criteria, it doesn't mean that can't be containerized. It just means you require further investigation. So we looked at the business case side of planning. We also looked at some considerations applying to discovery and application qualification for containerization. Provided we did everything right, we used the data to formalize the business case, calculated some story points leading into sprint planning. The next phase is to define the target state architecture as it will serve as blueprint for our future migrations. There are a few layers to this architecture and design piece. And the first one is to set up a AWS landing zone. Now you may do that using your own tooling or scripts, or you can use a AWS control tower service that provides best practice multi-account setup. Now number of accounts within your setup will be dependent upon number of environments and clusters you need. Usually you'll have separate AWS accounts for separate environments, as you need to think about security, fault isolation, and limit management. Number of VPCs will be dependent upon number of container clusters. And we suggest one-to-one -one mapping between VPC and a container cluster. VPCs still need to be made container ready. For example, EKS require minimum of two subnets per VPC and enough IP addresses to cater for worker nodes and pods. So we suggest slash 18 subnets for that. Private subnets for worker nodes and public subnets for internet facing load balancers. Security group design will be based on your application level networking needs, but also versions of Kubernetes, for example. Some older version of Kubernetes require specific ports to be opened between control plane and data plane. You also need to watch out for special tagging needs. For example, EKS require specific tags to be put on subnets it can use and where it can place internal or external load balancers. The next layer is container services. Again, taking EKS as an example. Are you using managed Kubernetes or self-managed or a third party? AWS supports all these options. From a cluster design perspective, number of clusters will be dependent upon your application requirements, business units, geographies, or to cater for a highly sensitive application separately. You can also use Kubernetes namespace to provide separation of concern within a single cluster. From a worker node perspective, we have a concept called managed node groups. Logical grouping of worker nodes for the purpose of lifecycle management. And worker nodes within the same group needs to be backed by same AMI, same instance type, and also IAM roles. You can bring your own AMI image which is optimized for EKS, but also aligns with your security requirements. Now it's great to have microservices architecture within your environment, but think about tens or hundreds of pods and containers serving your application or your business function. And it gets really hard to manage all those objects. So you need to think about automated service discovery for that. You may avail a third party tool such as console, or you can rely on your own mechanisms such as etcd, or you can use a combination of AWS App Mesh, our service mesh offering, and AWS Cloud Map, our cloud resource discovery service. From a pod networking perspective, you may avail AWS App Mesh, which provide application level networking or a pod level networking in this case. 
it's backed by Envoy Proxy, which is deployed as Sidecar within your environment. Or you can use a third-party service mesh such as Istio or rely on native VPC networking using CNI plugins for Kubernetes. You also need to think about putting your container images next to the runtime. For that, we suggest using AWS ECR, a managed container registry service. Using this service, you can host your own container images, but also the ones you buy from Marketplace. The next layer is application services or application architecture. First thing you need to do is to identify the migration pattern you're going to apply your particular application. Be it be the platform using monolithic services or refactor taking microservices way. This will be all dependent upon type of application you're dealing with and your appetite based on investment you can have in terms of time and resources for that application. You need to carefully design your pods because containers within your pods share resources such as IP addresses and volumes. So we suggest having one container serving your main application or microservice and one container serving as sidecar within a pod to keep the pod lightweight. Some services such as ingress require labels to connect to pods. So you make sure that you're using consistent labeling across all your deployments. You may also need to keep your container image as light as possible. And you can do that easily using multi-stage container build methodology. It allows you to have lightweight images, consume less storage, but also allowed for faster pulls and cold starts. You may also need to think about standardized logging frameworks such as Log4j. Use of standardized terminology for severity levels, consistent schema, and formats such as JSON. From a security perspective, shared responsibility model still applies. The key distinction is AWS manages security of the control plane below the line, and you as a customer look after security of data plane above the line. Now there are three key security domains you need to understand as a part of your architecture. The first domain is Kubernetes configuration. As mentioned before, you can use Kubernetes namespaces to provide separation of concern for teams using the same cluster. You can use RBAC or role-based access control to define which object has what access within the environment. You can use pod security policies to allow for pod or container level restrictions. For example, denying containers that wants to run as root. Use of network security policies applying on pods, making sure pods can only see the network they are meant to. The second security domain is container runtime. Container images are subject to internal and external attack factors, especially when you have rogue images running in your environment. So you can use something like ECR endpoint policy to restrict push and pull of images from whitelisted registries only. Also, you can use signed images to address man-in-the-middle pipeline level attacks. The third security domain is AWS services. You may consider enabling logging on EKS control plane, including API logs. Use of private only Kubernetes API access or restricting public access to the IP ranges you own. Use of ECR for image scanning on push and use of least privilege access on IAM roles, including the one that are assigned to Kubernetes service accounts. Moving to observability, which is a critical part of a container-based architecture. 
and here it means having meaningful insights into applications and resources running as containers by the means of logging and monitoring. There are three key dimensions to a best practice of observability solution. The first one is role-based. Developers care about application and service level, response codes and error codes, etc. Platform teams care about clusters, worker nodes, pods, their health status, scaling, utilization, etc. So you need to care for both type of roles. The second dimension is compatibility with the existing tool change. For example, being in AWS means you may be using CloudWatch and X-Ray. Or you may be using third-party partner toolset such as Datadog or Splunk. Or you may have your own self-managed open source tooling such as Prometheus. The third and key dimension is interoperability and ease of integration with your container orchestration platform, such as EKS, ECS, Fargate, self-managed Kubernetes on EC2. Now think about options available that cater for all three dimensions. First one to consider is AWS App Mesh. As I mentioned before, our service mesh offering that provide port level networking and insights. Or you can use Amazon CloudWatch Container Insights, a single unified solution for observability across your containers and other resources by the means of logs, metrics, events, alarms, and dashboards. So far, we looked at planning and discovery phases. We moved through architecture layers. We looked at AWS services in terms of landing zone, container services, application layer, security, monitoring and logging. Now, if you go back to the zoo story, looks like we have our enclosure sorted. So now it's time to move some animals, I mean applications. No matter which migration approach you choose, replatform or refactor, the key consideration here is to use continuous delivery pipelines, even for migration. Now, this may require some initial investment in terms of time to set up right pipelines. And it may be a learning curve for some. But once established, it will make your life so much easier and bring consistency across your teams in your organization. So here is an example of a migration pipeline based on AWS code pipeline, our managed continuous delivery service. So starting from left, so you're a developer, you just committed and push your code to AWS code commit, a Git-based managed source control service. This will trigger a build using AWS code build, our managed code build service. In this case, it will compile the code, run some initial test, and package the binaries in a new container image. One successful code pipeline natively will push the image to ECR. It will also update the deployment manifest in EKS with the new container image version, leading to deployment of application or update from the previous version. You may find this pipeline part of a AWS Samples GitHub repo. You may have a look, play around, and customize as per your requirement. Now let's look at the map again. And wow, we are at the last phase. And it's a critical one, operations. How do they maintain the zoo? Truth be told, if you plan well, qualified your applications, had best practices architecture, use the pipelines to move your animals, I mean applications. This should not be too hard, but there are still few considerations you may undertake. The first one is you need to continue to evolve your operational practices per 12 factor app principles. For example, Containers are not virtual machines. They are immutable, disposable objects. So no in-place patching or updates. Always rebuild and redeploy. 
The next one is change in release management associated with the cluster maintenance, upgrades and updates. Consider updating your non-production cluster first as it will deploy or redeploy API nodes. Then move to add-ons such as CNI plugin, QProxy, DNS, etc. Once that is done, test your applications on this updated cluster before propagating changes to the rest of the clusters. Third one is be consistent with your image tagging. Integrate that with your software release cycle. Always use image versions, not the latest tag, because it makes it hard to map which application version is running which version of your container image. The fourth and the last one is use Git as a source of truth for not only your software code, but also your manifest files. Consider checking in your YAML files and help chart files, etc. And deploy everything using pipelines. Avoid manual or CLI intervention at all costs. This not only provides a good governance mechanism, but this will help you actually contain your potential container sprawl in future. Now before I sign off, a quick recap. We looked at AWS Cloud Migration Framework as a map of a zoo. We also looked at migration phases as a sections on a map. We talked about bringing business value lens to preparation and planning. We looked at arch architectural considerations across the full stack, AWS layer, container services, and applications. We discussed migration powered by pipelines. And once migrated, continue with agile operations. Always look to evolve your operational practices for 12-factor app principles. So folks, I hope I've given you enough nuggets to chart your own container migration journey and make a meaningful impact. Thank you for watching this session.